our podcast series, Tricks of the Trades, uh, Trade, the podcast series where you learn from the best in the business. I'm your host, Rubani from Curate, which is an IIM alumni venture and India's first revenue tech firm, where we enable leading startups and corporations to maximize their revenue potential by helping them build their revenue team. Now, in these series, we invite industry experts such as yourself to share your practical tips, insights, and secrets of success. So whether you're an employee, a student, or a lifelong learner, there is always something valuable and interesting in every episode. So today, we have a very special guest with us, Roshan Karthik. Roshan is a sales development representative at Outplay, a sales engagement platform that helps sales teams book more meetings and close more deals. He is also an entrepreneur and the co-founder of two startups, or Focus, which designs and develops sustainable solutions for environmental problems, and Degen Solutions, which creates innovative applications using augmented reality. Roshan has a passion for technology, social innovation, and entrepreneurship. So, Roshan, welcome to the show, and thank you for joining us today. So, can you brief us about your education and professional journey? Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Rubani. It's, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, I think the the record for having the most, least qualified person on your podcast will be broken today. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, yeah, talk, answering your question, my education background is uh, in BTEC uh, Information Technology. So I studied here in Chennai at Anna University. Um, funny thing here is I I, I actually took nine years to complete my four-year engineering degree program because yeah I, I was not good with programming and it took this long for me to actually complete my course right yes and can you also brief us about your professional journey as well sure so i mean right out of college i i wasn't you know aware of what to do i was a i was you know a confused 22 year old kid um and that's when uh, you know my friend from college he told me that i'm you know working on uh, this product uh, and then when he showed me the product I was really interested with it and then that's how I joined my first startup Earth Focus in 2017 um, and the product is very simple it's a simple nozzle that you attach to taps and it helps in saving water when I saw the product I was really interested by it uh, I told him yeah sure I'm not doing anything in my life anyway so might as well hop onto this startup and that's how I started my first entrepreneurial journey I was with Earth Focus for about four years, from 2017 to 2021. I decided to drop off uh, from the company because, uh, you know, we had matured as a company in the in, in four years, and I felt that uh, my my expertise or my me being in in the company uh, will not have the greatest of impact, and I felt that my contribution would not have the greatest of impact in more pushing the company forward, and that's why I decided to, you know, step down as the co-founder in 2021. Um, and in and post that, um, I, uh, you know, worked with another friend of mine on augmented reality. We we did, we did develop a few applications and we worked with a few clients, but I kind of felt that the market for AR and AR as the technology itself is pretty new. Uh, and trying to, uh, you know, come up with a solution um, that can that that's uh, viable or feasible will take some more time. So that's that's that's, that's the reason why I decided to drop off from my second startup. And this was in 2022. Post that, I was looking for jobs. Um, I came across Outplay. Um, I felt that uh, you know the problem that they're uh, solving in the tech space, in the SaaS uh, sales space, was something really interesting. Um, I read about the company culture, all that was really uh, you know, very satisfied about it, and I I joined Outplay in uh, in October right. 2022. Yes, right. So speaking of sales as well as the career, right? So what inspired you to go into sales? Uh, uh, honestly, I I didn't uh, you know I didn't choose sales. I can say sales kind of chose me. So when I when I started with Earth Focus in 2017. Uh, right. You know, we just had a prototype back then. We didn't have a product or anything like that. So, mm. you know, on one side, we were trying to refine the product, trying to, you know, uh, make it fit for the Indian consumer. Right. Um, and on the other side, you know, once product is ready, someone has to, you know, 
uh, be there to you know pitch it to people, sell it to people, and all that. Um, and it was just the two of us. We didn't have a team. We didn't have uh, you know we didn't raise any funds or anything. So it was just the two of us, me and my friend. So you know my friend he took care of the designing part, and I was the one who took care of operations and sales. So that's how I started with sales. I it was not something I chose. Uh, you know, knowing anything about sales, I was I was completely new. I had no idea about sales. Uh, I mean, the only experience I had in sales was salespeople calling me. I've never, okay. I've, I've never done any sales in my life before that. So yeah, I learned along on the way, made a lot of mistakes. Uh, yeah, that that's about it. Uh, and today, when when but when in, when choosing my career uh, with Outplay. But I did choose the SDR role because I've been doing sales my whole life, um, and that's and I did grow uh, a passion for sales because and I also was pretty good at sales, uh, right. interacting with people. Uh, you know, you, as as a salesperson, you technically are the face of the company when you're interacting with the potential customers or prospects. Um, so yeah, for all these reasons, I and and I think. No day is the same day for, for a sales guy. So because you're interacting with a lot of people, uh, each mm -hmm. conversation is pr potentially different. Each uh, prospect you reach out to will probably have a different problem that your product or service can solve for. So mm -hmm. that's that's the reason why I chose SDR as, as a role uh, in Outplay. And honestly, no, no other company was giving me a job. Mm -hmm. right. So yeah. Right. So what is your day as an SDR, you know, when Outplay looks like? So I think it's divided about into three, four things. So, mm -hmm. you know, at the start of the day, we have like a stand-up call okay. wherein we discuss uh, uh, how 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 has your week been? How are we planning this the forthcoming week? Um, any interesting conversations that we have had with prospects? Anything that you can share? All that. So that's that's the first half an hour of our day, and then uh, we go out and reach out to our. Uh, uh, prospects based on the research we do. So we use like any any sales rep would use. We use LinkedIn. We do a lot of Google search. We we, we subscribe to a lot of uh, you know communities on LinkedIn, on Slack and all that. Mm -hmm. So we leverage all these channels, do our research and start reaching out to customers. Uh, I mean, prospects, um, you know, so that's the second part of the day. Um, and we do have like um, a particular designated R for making cold calls. So right. that's the final chunk of the day. And then uh, towards the end of the day, we just have like a final, like let's say a five minute catch up call within the team itself to see how has the day been, whether you've had any interesting conversations, whether somebody has shouted at you on a cold call, whether you've had a bad day, which, you know, we just, we just try to cheer each other up and that's how we close the day. That is great. So coming on to the questions as well. So. Uh, how do you conduct market research to understand your target audiences, you know, needs and preferences? And what are some of the effective techniques for gathering this information? Um, so I I personally don't do a lot of market research per se, mm -hmm. um, but I do kind of do. So we have like certain conditions um, or criteria that, uh, you know, a particular uh, uh, particular prospect or a particular company or that that they you know fulfill for us to be able to solve their problem so mm -hmm. that's that's something we have uh, designed that's that's something we have already fixed and uh, it's made ready for us um, but we do kind of do some research before reaching out to prospects within that company um, so we go on to their LinkedIn profile we go to their website to see what the company is doing um, who their decision makers are what what is the, what is what is you know what does their product do um and things like that and we use uh linkedin over here again to see you know what's happening within the company whether they're uh, whether they've raised any funding um we use a lot of other tools for example crunchbase is something that we use to, to gather some insights about the company and all that so this is from like an sdr point of view that the kind of research that i do um yeah and uh, what was your second question again yeah, the second question was that how do you, what are some of the effective techniques for gathering this information? Uh, yeah, certain techniques, like I mentioned, we use a lot of tools, um, mm -hmm. LinkedIn, LinkedIn Sales Navigator, uh, right. and a few other 
uh, you know, communities on LinkedIn, on Slack. We have other tools like Crunchbase where you can get information about the company and all that. So these are certain, not too many tools because I think uh, that that would probably be an overkill of information and an information overload, but just like these four or five different tools and platforms. Right, that is great. And what are some of the key factors to consider when you do determining a customer's budget and purchasing authority? I mean, budgets and uh, it's, it's, it's something that you try to discover when you start interacting with the customer, because mm -hmm. uh, I really don't think that there's a way to, uh, you, I mean, you can get certain insights about their buying from LinkedIn, Sales Navigator, but okay. uh, ultimately when you do sit and have the conversation with your prospect, you understand if what kind of budgets do they have, if they are on a budget freeze, so on and so forth. Um, talking about authority, um, it depends on the kind of uh, persona you're selling to. So I I sell, I mean, Outplay as a product is designed for salespeople. So I technically reach out to, uh, you know, sales managers, uh, VP of sales and all that. So mm -hmm. these are the people who are in the decision making power that they can implement a, a new tool within their company. Or if, if, if I'm not able to reach to the decision maker, I somewhat uh, I reach out to someone who can influence the decision maker right. in in this process. So I either reach out to the influencer or mm -hmm. the you know the decision maker within the company. Right. So considering this as well, so what are some of the effective strategies for identifying, say, like their decision making process and then stakeholders as well? Um, so I, I, this, this is again something that we uncover when we start interacting with them. Right. So on a call, on a call with uh, with the prospect or even on an email, um, mm -hmm. you know, I I get to have these conversations with them. I ask them, hey, uh, you know, what is what is the sales process like in your company right. today? Um, how do you implement certain tools that you're already been implementing? Right. Um, you know, who uh, you know, if if there are other people that I need to speak to within the company, who would they be? Uh, who, who, who else could I bring, bring to this conversation? So these are the kind of conversations we have uh, with our prospects. Right, right. And uh, how can salespeople effectively ask open-ended questions, you know, to uncover a customer's pain points and challenges? Um, I think it, it comes down to how you have uh, conversations with them. So the primary objective of when when I get on a call with uh, a prospect is not to just somehow try to you know book a meeting or you know hit my quota. It's it's primarily to have a conversation with them. So yeah. and in this process of having a conversation, I try to uncover certain pain points that they have. So mm -hmm. you know, uh, and this is where research comes really handy. Um, um, you know, if, if you have some insights on what uh, what tools that they're using, any process, uh, you know, the processes in their uh, in their organization, uh, what problem does their uh, product or service solve for? So, using all these insights, you you try and build a conversation over there. And once you start building conversations, you ask them, are they facing any potential challenges with uh, you know the current sales process? Um, if if um, and if they don't really have uh, any challenges you, you can ask them like do you wish that you could achieve something with the current sales process or with the current sales tools that you're not able to achieve uh, right. currently so these are some open-ended questions I, that I ask them right and how can sales people also you know differentiate themselves from their competitors during the prospecting phase um, so it's important to understand who your competitors are and to uh, always be um, you know learning new tools and new products in the market i mean it's it's i think it's kind of uh, it's really hard to have have all the competitors all all of their um, you know usps uh, you know remember having it always in your mind because they probably are 100 people who are doing the same thing right. but it's important to understand that uh, what you what your product is doing and mm -hmm. and to really identify the key features of your product and how it can solve for the problem that uh, that your prospect is facing. So this is where, again, open-ended questions really help a lot. So when you uncover uh, your prospect's pain points, you uncover uh, you know the, their processes uh, that they have, systems that they have in place, um, that's where you, 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 you will be, you'll know that, okay, 
you know they have these systems these processes in place and uh, okay. this is a potential challenge that they're facing which they're not able to achieve with their current uh, you know tools and this right. is where your your product or service can come in and solve for that right and so I, I believe there is follow-ups that are required for this as well, right? So yes. I just wanted to understand from your perspective. So how much of how much follow-up would you say is too much or you know, just equivalent to that is something that is needed when you're dealing with a client? So I mean typically the uh, we have like a, a sequence of steps that we follow. Right. Um and uh, and and it, it has anywhere between 12 to 16 steps so these right. are including uh, phone calls emails linkedin messages and all that so mm -hmm. i think about 12 to 16 is is like the is the range of of the number of uh, steps that uh, a sales rep follows before they can get to any sort of uh, you know response from the prospect uh, right. but you know there are cases yeah. where even if you after your 16 steps and follow-ups there's no response from the prospect sometimes the prospects response within the second or third step itself so right. but it um, you know with the current trends in the market today i think anywhere between 12 to 16 steps is is a good number to have right and uh, how do you also handle objections and rejections in your sales processes? Rejection handling, I think it, it's it, it's something that you acquire over time. So I've been in sales for about seven years now. So it's something that, uh, you know, the first rejection that you have is always, you know, it's going to hurt. Um, and I've had colleagues of mine say that, you know, they have, uh, they've been really traumatized. They've had like a sleep, sleepless night because of uh, certain rejections that, uh, that they face. But but one thing that, that might help you is to understand that the prospect is not shouting at you or he's not, you know, abusing you or, you know, he's not saying no to you in particular. But uh, maybe the, the time you reached out to him is probably wasn't right. He might have, he might, you know, the prospect might be in some sort of an emergency and you might, you might actually be in, uh, have been disturbing the prospect and you know which is why he that that reaction was uh, you know you got that reaction so uh, right. so i think it's important to understand that uh, the rejections that you're facing is not something personal i mean the prospect you're reaching out to doesn't even know you so uh, there's no reason for him to you know just be 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 a bad person or something yeah. he doesn't even the prospect doesn't even know you so he's he's just rejecting uh, at that point in time so maybe if you follow up with him after after the after a few uh, days or maybe a week or so you might get another response from the prospect right. um, i mean but it does it does take a lot of time to uh, handle rejections well uh, right. talking about objections um I think objections are uh, when a prospect throws an objection. I think it's a great way for you to also build conversations. Um, so that's how I kind of look at it. And a lot of objections that we see that people talk about are are not actually objections. It's it's actually the prospect telling you the truth. So a lot of people say that uh, when a prospect says, "Hey, I don't have money." Uh, to purchase um, a new tool or to go for your product to go for your service that's not really not an objection the prospect over there at that point in time is telling you the truth um, and uh, and when he's doing that he's actually probably helping you uh, and telling you that hey you know what now is not the time you're probably going to waste more time talking to me uh, you know you can make a note of you know to circle back maybe six months down the line one year down the line whenever um, and then you move on to your next prospect so you're probably wasting time on me right now, but you know I, I'm, happy, I'm happy to have this conversation six months down the line. Right. Uh, yeah. And then when he says I'm using your competitor or whatever whatever it is, these are potential conversation building uh, nuggets that uh, that uh, that we as sales reps are you know catch on to and try to build the conversation from there. Right. So that's how I kind of look at objections. Right. So. Uh... You know, when you're dealing with clients, I believe there is uh, a need to build a relationship with them as well, right? So yes. how important would you say is it to build a relationship outside of the uh, sales process as well? Oh, it's super important. Um, so, and and I think building relationships is, it, it's, it's the key over here. So especially yeah. on a cold call, uh, you know, you probably have like five minutes uh, that you talk to the prospect. Right. Over there, you try to understand his, the 
you know, prospects entire sales process over there. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's super important to have that, you know, uh, to be actually able to willing to have conversations with the prospect uh, okay. rather than just trying to force the sale, you know, being too pushy or anything can, you know, can do you more harm than good. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think relationship building is really important. Um, and what would you say are some of your effective strategies to build a potential relationship with a client? Um, there is no like a, a fixed formula or a, you know a fixed strategy that I follow. It's mm -hmm. it, you know I always try and do something different or I try and you know with with anything. So even with my opening on cold calls or you know the way I send emails or anything like that. But by and large, I think it's it's just having coming down to having conversations. So um, let's say you. Uh, your prospect is really active on LinkedIn and then the, mm -hmm. the prospect is actually posting a lot of really uh, useful information. So, I mean, that's that's something that you can use to, uh, you can probably tell the prospect, hey, I used um, this information that you shared about whatever, and then it helped me a lot. So I think when someone hears that they're helping out people when they really are not, when they really don't know, or they're not aware that they're helping people or their content is helping people, uh, that's something that you can use to build a relationship and just be genuine. Um, uh, being genuine and authentic is really important as well in building the right. relationship. Right. So what are also some of the best practices or tools that you use to, you know, uh, make your sales processes a lot easier? Um, I mean, best practices, uh, there are a lot of things that I follow, but I don't, I, I don't always stick to these best practices. So, right. So, for example, um, you know, uh, if you go online and if you if you type in, you know, what is the format for the best cold email, you probably have a lot of, uh, you know, blogs and websites telling you how, what is the format that you, you should follow for writing a cold email. But uh, often I've actually gone, I've not followed any structure or any format like this, and I've gotten the best responses I've gotten for my uh, cold email. So there are a few, you know, uh, certain basic principles that I follow, but I don't stick to anything. Um, it's it's not concrete. So sales is something that's always evolving, right? There is no one formula that fits all. I mean, if there was a formula that uh, fits all, we'll all be real rich by now. <laughs> we'll all be millionaires by now. But okay. it's always imp uh, important to keep uh, improving, keep iterating your process uh, to see what works for you. And there are different avenues for selling today. You know, you could be making calls, you could be sending out emails, uh, LinkedIn, you know, you could be doing uh, sales on a communities, on a, on different communities, either on Slack, Discord or LinkedIn. So, I mean, discover what what is your strength. So if, if you're good at writing, you're probably good at emails. Um, if you're good at talking, you're probably good at cold calls. So the things, uh, try and figure out what you're good at and, uh, you know, double down on that. Uh, that doesn't mean that you ignore the other avenues. You still, right. you know, you could leverage them as well by building skills uh, relevant to those avenues. Um, but yeah, I mean, these are, I think, very basic principles that uh, that one needs to follow, uh, you know, to become uh, good in sales. Right. So how do you also leverage data and analytics to, you know, improve your B2B sales outreach efforts? And what are some of the key metrics and KPIs that you use to track and how do you use this information to sort of like re-refine your approach? Um, so, I mean, as a sales rep, it's important to track uh, what's working and what's not working. Right. So, uh, and then, and you know, I mean, I I, I don't want to dial, you know, uh, transition to con the conversation to uh, Outplay as a product, but uh, right. you know, using Outplay, uh, you can get a lot of uh, in you know, key insights on, uh, you know, your cold uh, outbound sales. So, you know, the number of calls that you're making, the calls that got answered, what is the best time to make calls? Uh, what is the best time to send out emails that gets you the best open rates, you know, reply rates and all that. Um, and how many, how many prospects have you added? Uh, are you reaching out from a particular company? Uh, is, is, is the company actually your right persona? Uh, can your product or service actually solve for them? Uh, these are some things that I, that I track, uh, you know, very key, very keenly. 
and and, uh, and and out of all these outreach activities how many how many how many prospects actually came onto a meeting how many people how many prospects actually found the uh, you know uh, the product or service really useful um, right. and then how many actually eventually closed uh, to a sale um, and if if they didn't uh, you know move ahead with the sale they didn't move ahead with uh, with purchasing the product or solution um, right. what are the reasons for that uh, it's important to follow up if they say no as well not just yeah. yes so i mean these are uh, certain things that i track uh, yeah that's right what. so what are some of the most common mistakes that sales professionals make when it comes to b2b sales outreach and how can these mistakes also be you know avoided and what are some of the best practices for successful outreach um i think mistakes uh one mistake that uh, that i see a lot of people doing is uh, they they being too pushy with the sale so when yeah. someone says that you know i'm i yeah. i generally don't have uh, you know budgets or money to make make a purchase this year uh, but even when you hear that let's say maybe twice or thrice uh, you, in spite of that you you being pushy or you being forceful to the sale uh, i think these are you 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 probably won't i mean the prospect since uh, they don't have the budgets or the money to buy your product uh, or you know or service you, you know the, the transaction is not going to happen and you've probably uh, burned the relationship that uh, you've built with the prospect over there because yeah. he uh, the prospect knows you as someone being too pushy on, uh, of doing the sale uh, he probably smells your commission red that uh, you know what he's probably just doing this for the commission uh don't let uh, people know that uh, know of these things your intention over here should be to build a conversation with the prospect to have a conversation with your prospect to see if if your product or service can solve for them um, right. um and you know uh, too many follow ups uh you know following up with the prospect multiple times in a day like four or five times a day calling them four or five times a day right. being too pushy all these things are a big no i mean i mean we know right when we get uh, calls from uh, credit card companies or whatever it is uh, and then uh, them being too pushy is you know we get angry when that happens so it's the same for the prospect you're reaching out to as well it's no different so just stop being too pushy uh, you know don't try and force the sale uh, build genuine conversations in your outbound sales right so that was some great advice roshan that was the last question from my end thank you so much for joining us for the for this podcast and i hope you had a great time i did thank you so much for having me here thank you thank you so much for coming here and spending your time with us and have a good day ahead you too bina thank you so thank much thank you thank you so much bye bye